So I'm going to talk not about the the new New Royal, which is still, as everyone knows, yet to open and supposed to be opening at the latest uh, source in 2022, but I believe that when I see it. I'm talking about the problems behind the building of the old Royal, which they'll soon be knocking down to replace with car parking facilities for the new one. And that, as a bearded man once said, history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as far. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the background to the, the old building to kind of show how it's very much the same thing happening again. Also trying to sort of uh, puncture some of the, the urban myths and illusions around the, the old royal as well. So here we are. This is my, my opening bit. Effectively, it's, it's a new hospital. It's actually a new hospital. But more than that, it's a new hospital that was the final act of Andy Burnham when he was the health minister under the new Labour government from uh, under Gordon Brown, uh, that he signed off the approval for the, the building. And since then, it's now uh, 11 years, and it'll be even further when it's finally completed for it to become operational. But it's also a reduction in the number of beds being offered that as the main teaching hospital for the city of Liverpool, although it's been slightly clipped by entry in recent years, is it can reduce to around 650. So in terms of the number of patients going through potentially on a regular basis, the capacity has been decreased at the same time that the old site has been uh, run down and left to ruin for a number of years. And hopefully the more eagle-eyed of you can see that in the background. And, the whole build, just to kind of recap, is beset by problems. It's more than doubled in cost from its original uh, quote. Uh, it's been delayed considerably, both before Carillion, the main uh, building contractor, went bust, but then also after that, because there's a period of time where there's no building work done, never mind the impact on coronavirus. There's also been major problems with the structural design that two of the main steel supports holding up the building were shown to be faulty and had to be or in the process of being replaced entirely, never mind the cladding on the building, which is at the same time that it went up in flames at Grenfell. It's an enormous tragedy. So building a hospital in that is not the wisest of moves. It's a white elephant from start to finish, an enormous problem um, that's kind of beset the, the city of Liverpool and with the potential private finance initiative um, costs i.e. part share between the public and the private sector, that likely is set to continue, unfortunately, for at least another 25 or 30 years, despite the fact that the Department of Health have um, committed some money forwards uh, to kind of covering the cost difference. So I'm going to talk about exactly the same issues. Over budget, delayed, main contractor going bust, shrinking capacity and a financial uh, impact that still lingers or lingered until very recently with the city of Liverpool but it's effectively the story of the old royal is very much one of the new royal and I'm going to do this in, in uh, two ways I'm going to show mainly uh, the odd quote but mainly images that I've dug up in my archival research of the the royal and its kind of planning from the, the 1930s which may be of interest or should be of interest right through to when it opened in October 1978 so I'm just doing five uh, chronological bits Firstly, about a bit of the background as to why there was an argument made for a new big teaching hospital in Liverpool at that time, uh, from roughly the 1930s through to 1948 when the NHS was created. Then, onto the kind of uh, wilderness years when the NHS came to being, but there was no plan really or what to do about building new hospitals across uh, Britain. And then thirdly, what happened when um, the plan was given and hospital stock, bearing in mind it's mostly old decrepit Victorian buildings, started to be replaced. Fourthly, all the crises that hit the build um, and trying to cover some of those and particularly how and why they hit and why they made the situation far worse than ever really needed to be. There's also a lot of problem uh, around leadership and particularly the intervention of the Department of Health and the Treasury. And then lastly, the kind of impact of this uh, when it finally opened in the kind of latter phase of the 1970s. So firstly, it's a bit strange to talk about a new National Health Service hospital that opened in 1978 by beginning in 1935. But I'm hoping those of you who've got longer memories will remember me talking a little bit about this the last time. So a brief recap, and I've only got two organisational diagrams, so I'm trying to keep it to a minimum. Bear in mind, that's my, my kind of thing. So before the National Health Services, they, they were divided, health services were divided effectively into to four or three and a half, really that from 1911 you had GPs available to working men, not women, uh, on kind of a larger scale. You separ had separate from that uh, mental hospitals, then they were called asylums, but they changed names in 1923. And across the region, there were quite a few of those that were servicing patients from Liverpool, and they were maintained separately um, in terms of an oversight body. Then you have um, 
the public health department led by the medical officer. It's uh, run by the local authority, by the council, and it's effectively running public hospitals before the NHS. So what, what happened in 1929, there was a major piece of legislation called the Local Government um, 1929 Local Government Act, which, which municipalized effectively old workhouses. So um, orphanages, um, a lot of the ones, even including the one on Brownlow Hill, they all became public hospitals overnight. I mean, they weren't really hospitals that we would recognize today, but it brought them into the public sphere for the first time with a, a commitment by the government to invest in them. And then lastly, you had what were called voluntary, so-called voluntary hospitals, which are private hospitals run for profit. And these are split into two, really. The first set, are those where medical education and teaching takes place, um, which is kind of the creme de la creme uh, of those both within Liverpool, but also nationally, you know, they're maybe even internationally, given the kind of clone reputation they had, they're, they're, they're big institutions. And then you have other voluntary hospitals, which kind of maintain a whole variety of things. So you have places like St Paul's, which still exists today in the Royal Dealing in Specialist uh, Eye Care and Eye Treatment. You had a foot hospital. There are over 20 hospitals outside the teaching hospitals in Liverpool at this moment in time. So there are an enormous number, but they're usually only quite small, near between you know, a handful of beds right through to the, the Royal, the largest with over 300. So that's healthcare before the NHS. And so I'm focusing just to go um, back on the previous slide on the concentration of the four teaching hospitals. So in 1935, there was a report done, and come on to this in a moment, by the Vice Chancellor, no less, of the University of Liverpool, talking about the problems of medical education. And he said, um, supported by the Ministry of Health, that they needed to bring them all onto one site because students from the university were traveling all over uh, to sites of varying degrees of support and help to get medical education for world-class hospitals and world-class city, but, but Liverpool was as the, the second city of empire then. So these are those hospitals. So my, my born dates, the building date. So you have the, the David Lewis Northern, uh, which has since been knocked down, adjacent to the docks, which treated enormous amounts of accidents, um, orthopedic casualties from people that are injured in a place of work. It's you know, um, a specialist learning center as well as a treatment one. You've then got the Royal Southern Hospital, which does the same kind of work, uh, but in the southern uh, area of the Docklands around Toxteth. So it's based just off the map on uh, Carroll Street near Grafton Street and where the uh, the kind of warehouses are and the the old uh, gas works is or gas works was and that again damaged during the second war now demolished you've then got the Stanley Hospital just north of Scotland Road on, on Stanley Road but just as it goes off which again was built slightly later you can't see on this uh, diagram but that's in 1874 um, again elite institution bombed during the slight damage during the war knocked down in 1965-1968 and lastly, you've got the Liverpool Royal Infirmary, which still stands today as uh, the Water House Building University of Liverpool. So that's where they are. And I'm hoping while I've been talking, you've got a sense of some of the geography of these hospitals. That imagine you're a University of Liverpool medical student at this time or a consulting doctor, and you're traveling across all these different sites, that it was a real problem in a way that at the same time in 1935, they were being centralized in Manchester, they were being centralized in Liverpool, uh, in Leeds, they've been centralized in Birmingham. Liverpool, in order to kind of keep pace, had to bring them together. So this is the voice of the report by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Liverpool in the Hospitals Commission about the, the issue. And so in 1935, although there were four physically separate hospitals, the, the Stanley, the Northern, the Southern and the Royal brought together in the same organisation called the Royal uh, United Liverpool Hospitals as a result of this report. And so the, this makes the case effectively for not only the unification organisationally, there's like a, a group of hospitals, but that in order to read the benefits of unification, they need to have one site, one build, one place where modern medical education can be developed and provided. And so, again, just while I'm talking at the top of it, you hope you have a, a sense of the, the reasons behind that. In the report, they talk about the congested crowd crowded in a city Victorian streets that dominated Liverpool at that time that they were kind of isolated buildings often close and easy to get to for people living nearby but for the patients who came from far and wide bearing in mind that these teaching hospitals served as far afield as Anglesey, Barrow, uh, most of North Wales they, they were big regional institutions as well and they needed some of investment to make them better but because it was private investment that wasn't going to be forthcoming very easily. So rationalisation was all part of this agenda. So in 1939, the secretary of the United, the Royal United Liverpool Hospitals, a guy called A.B.J. Hines, publishes a kind of a case for change, as it were, for modern medical education called Hospital Testament, where he says we need to bring together these hospitals 
um, to make modern manipulation is big. That's really the central argument that that's where the case at the kind of with the local authority and between the Royal Liverpool United Hospital was made that they needed a new hospital. It was going to be approved by the Ministry of Health in principle. It was just a question of how it would be financed, funded and organised, bearing in mind that there was a bit of a, a shaky relationship between the private sector and the public at this time and how it was going to work. But it was a big commitment. They needed a new thousand bed teaching hospital for the city of Liverpool to bring together these old hospitals, agreed in 1935. So what happens with this agreement into the National Health Service? Again, I'm hoping this diagram looks familiar because it's the same one as the one before. When the NHS was made, it effectively nationalised the previous arrangement of health and hospital services just under a national umbrella. So GPs were retained, but instead of insurance committees, they became executive councils, same people, same job, same thing, slightly different title. Public health are the big losers within local authorities because they kept a range of community services that they had before, but they lost all their hospitals because the hospitals were nationalised. But nationalised hospitals were still governed in two. The first set maintained by Liverpool Regional Hospital Board were the old public authority workhouses, the old local authority ones that were brought together into different kind of distinct groupings. And I talked a bit about this in the last time that I spoke, but some of the other non-teaching voluntary hospitals, so um, St Paul's and some of the others, were brought under the Regional Hospital Board, whereas the teaching hospitals remained separate, they remained distinct, and ABJ Hines, the secretary in 1939, remained in post until 1969. So effectively, nationalisation means keeping what was there before, but just run by the, the central government uh, in theory, but not in practice. So what does this mean? In 1948, they still got approval for a new hospital because they had it in 1935, but the local um, United Liverpool hospitals, which is kind of the, the group responsible for the, the teaching hospitals, they just couldn't get the, any more development. These were years of austerity, uh, although the welfare state was born, there was very little investment in the National Health Service, and there were only a handful of hospitals even built during this time. So what were they trying to do? Before the war, there was a big push that the best place to build it with available land and available resources for a private organisation, bearing in mind that's what it was before it was nationalised, was to build it just in front of what is now the Anglican Cathedral. But that was seen as the best area because it was adjacent to Rodney Street, which was the main area of private practice in the city of Liverpool. And there was a series of uh, visits made by the, the kind of governing body to hospitals in Europe. And that's my tenuous European link for this presentation is that they went to the Karolinska in Sweden, uh, in particular among a handful of others, uh, quite nefariously Nazi Germany at the time as well. They were very besotted with Nuremberg for a whole host of other curious reasons. But effectively, that was the plan before the war. But this changed during the war. So two things happened. Firstly, the civil defence uh, and the impact of the war had a major thinking on planners. So the Royal Liverpool, which is the photograph you can see in the corner, that was bombed along with another set of institutions and hospitals in the city of Liverpool. And they were badly damaged during the Blitz in May 1941. But the other thing you need to be mindful of, and this is evident in the, the document that I'm showing there on the top, is that civil planners were worried about the impact of nuclear war and they didn't want to concentrate all of the city's major uh, institutions in the city centre in case there should be nuclear attacks and they'd be completely obliterated. So they advocated building near what is now Broad Green Hospital and developing there, but that was kind of rejected for reasons that I'll come on to. So this impacts on the thinking about what to do and where to build. And there's a whole series of debates during the 1940s and 50s about should we build in the centre, should we build at the periphery? But the Luftwaffe did a very good job for Liverpool um, hospital planners because they bombed large chunks of the city, making it derelict. And by the time that it was cleared, it became a very attractive site. And so the site where it currently rests, and which was talked about back in the 1930s, suddenly became made available because it was full of lots of empty sites as well. And so this map, I'm kind of going to overlay with the next one in a second. So you'll see lots of blank spaces because it's linked to a map of ownership about what it's done. So the yellow sites consist, and bearing in mind this map is from 1955, um, shows that there are large swathes um, of the area already either derelict by bombing, cleared, or uh, large areas of residential properties combined with a couple of other factories in the convent that was later, um, as we know, all sort of swept away as part of the advance. So Liverpool City Council is a bit reluctant uh, to begin with, but they eventually approved to build the hospital on this new site rather than in front of the cathedral. A lot of that's to do with the geology of the rock, and there's a very 
boring report about that within the files that I've looked through. So there is eventually a shift of a consensus in moving the site from in front of Hope Cathedral right to where it's built in the present day. So that happens by 1962. What else happens in 1962? Enoch Powell, pictured here with his daughter, not only as a major massive racist, but he was the Minister of Health and he launched the single largest uh, hospital investment funding in the National Health Service that it's, it's ever known from its inception in 1962, effectively saying that rather than doing it on a case by case basis, the whole lot needs to be replaced on a more systematic basis. And so he publishes the hospital plan for England and Wales, which um, try to sweep away all these old premises in the next sort of 15, 20 years and build new hospitals. And Liverpool, um, the new teaching hospital that's been advocated and approved since 1935, is swept up into this. So although the, the local organisation running the, the teaching hospital has been buying up land, knocking down areas, trying to develop it in advance of this 1962 hospital plan, they've not really got very far because the ministry has been very hesitant. But this all changes in 1962. So what happens next? So the, the influential man here is uh, Lord Holford, William Holford, who in nine, again, back in the 1930s, was involved in the kind of intellectual movement about how to redevelop Liverpool and Merseyside. And he published quite an influential report, which um, made the, the shape of the post-war town plan from 1944-1945, the big Liverpool council town plan that was published, shaped modern Liverpool. He was a very influential figure behind that. Holford was also a professor in civic design and architecture at the University of Liverpool, and he ran a consultancy firm which developed um, plans, effectively, in architectural design. And he was commissioned back again in the 1940s to develop the hospital because they wanted it to be a big um, song and a dance, a big speak about what Liverpool was doing. They wanted it to be about Liverpool, with the Liverpoolian designer and the Liverpool kind of blueprint. It was very much about that strong civic image. And so Holford had been on board long before 1962 when the hospital got approval. And so he was then um, commissioned, um, although he kind of obviously devolved a lot of the work to one of his subordinates, a guy called William Shannon, to build the blueprint. There was a series of kind of comings and goings about what the final um, image of the hospital should look like. But by the mid 1960s, there was an agreement about the, the kind of final shape of what it would look, how it would look, and also because of the agreement on the land, where it would be. So in its current site that became developed. And keeping with the aesthetics of the time, again, they go around uh, Europe because there is a whole series of hostile developments taking place after the Second World War in areas um, badly damaged by um, fighting, particularly again in Germany. And this is part of the architectural uh, thinking that influences uh, Holford and Shannon in the design. And again, here's just another um, image that what you probably wouldn't see from this kind of image is that you just get a load of buildings for different purposes, but it shows there's a consolidation of everything on one side, which is why I've got the kind of single site, single centre as a title, because the new dental hospital, as it is now, has also been built there, and that's run by a separate body. The blood transfusion centre is run by a separate body um, within the kind of local NHS organisation, but that's also been built on the same site. But what you have effectively is that there's a real centralisation of all medical um, specialism and expertise on this one site in kind of the mind of the planners. They want to bring everything together that's within walking distance of the new medical school which is being thrown up on the corner uh, of the building down at uh, Pembroke Place so everything is consolidated in the interests of medical education and this kind of civic image not in the needs of patients or the, the people of Liverpool uh, and kind of their imagination so after it's commissioned after it starts to take place after the design uh, is approved in the early 1960s uh, McAlpine get the contract for the first phase, which is to build uh, some of the nursing from previous slides, some of the nurse housing blocks, the boiler house and some of the other kind of peripheral buildings rather than the main site. And so this photograph from the Echo uh, is taken just at the kind of uh, handover phase of the first phase when McAlpine got the contract. It's a little bit late, 12, 16 weeks. It's marginally over budget. Bear in mind that there's a lot, quite a lot of inflation at this time, which kind of pushed prices up anyway, and there's a shortage of uh, materials as well, but it's within realms of acceptability. And it starts to then, after this kind of period, 62, when the hospital plan comes into place, up until McAlpine hands over the, the first phase in 70, things are delayed, but for an enormous project, it's kind of going all right, that uh, everyone's kind of reasonably on board. And then 
enormous series of concurrent crises hit, which shape all of the impacts which happen right through today. So what happened? The, I've taken the two sets of quotes from the 1975 Public Accounts Committee report into the, the Liverpool Hospital build, bearing in mind that there's a 2019, 2020 National Audit Office one for the other royal, that it's a problem of national proportions very quickly as things start to go into difficulty. And there's a quote here uh, about some of the background to some of the contractual negotiations of the bill that historically the Ministry of Housing uh, and local government had been paying additional money, a so-called Merseyside waiting, for all projects undertaken on the area. Um, this was because a number of issues around the local labour market conditions, relationships with unions, but also the, the fixed nature of many of the building work contracts. And so Lord Holford, because he's done other building work on Merseyside, is aware of this. He tells the United Liverpool Hospitals, who are the management organisation, and they tell the Department of Health that, hold on a minute, this is something we need, need to be mindful of, that Liverpool is going to be more expensive than anywhere else, and other areas of government are doing this too. This needs to be factored in early on. And so this is why I've got the, the Holford quote, because it's very prophetic. So he says that there are lots of national firms who are capable of undertaking a bid this size, who understand the difficulties involved, and they also mean that due to the specialist nature of the contract, that it's going to cost more. So this has to be factored into any estimates in the slightest. And so this is sort of spoken about very early on. It's unearthed by the Public Accounts Committee. They kind of ask, why, why is it taking so long to, to come to view when they start investigating in 1975? So the warning signs are already there right at the very start of the bill that Liverpool is different for a whole set of reasons and they need to be factored into the contracts that's negotiated with the major tenders who are going to do it. The Department of Health, because they want to have kind of consistency across the board, say that, that's not the case. Liverpool is the same as everywhere else. It must be treated as such. Estimates can't be higher. Contracts have to be negotiated on the same terms. That's how it goes ahead. And so ultimately, a lot of the responsibility lays not with the local hospital planners who've wanted this building for, you know, by this stage, 30 years. It relies with the Department of Health. So what happens? It all goes south very quickly. So in 1965, part of the reason why McAlpine start to withdraw from their tendering on the second contract is because that they can't recover the, raise, the rising costs from uh, the people who are paying the bill because the local uh, United Liverpool hospitals who run it locally, uh, the hospital build, have to get approval from the Department of Health, who have to get approval from the Treasury. And they basically say, no, our initial estimate is what it's going to cost. Anything else you can't have. So there's a whole series of litigation uh, behind the scenes on the advance and development of the first bill. And so because they're aware of these rising costs, McAlpine and Bovis, two of the biggest building companies at the time, their tenders for the phase two build are rejected because they're so different to everyone else's because in hindsight, they're more realistic. So in 1967, a reasonably small firm called Tursons, uh, which is owned by Power Securities Limited and it's a subsidiary of theirs, they obtained the contract for phase two, which is the main build, the big building that I showed you there, the slide of a moment ago. And so in 1969, because of the kind of scale and the number of contracts that uh, they're running, British Insulated Calendar Cables, which is a Liverpool-based uh, kind of organization, they buy Tursons parent company, not because they want Tursons, but because they want to buy Balfour Beatty, because it's very profitable and they see it as a way to advance their um, kind of monopolization in the building industry. And so in 1970, the end of the photo I had in the last bit, phase one is complete, but there is this acrimony over the final settlement, which doesn't actually conclude until 1975, 1976. So even though the building's up, even though it's finished to an uh, appropriate standard, Money's not handed over, and this creates a lot of acrimony as well. So in 1971, there are a series of meetings, repeated meetings in central London, because of the, uh, the breakdown of relationship between Holford, not really Holford, but William Shannon, uh, who's the main architect responsible, Tursons and their uh, contractors and United Local Hospitals over the development of the build. And they just that uh, kind of leadership level breakdown impacts everything else across the board and it just slowed everything down. So what had been 12 to 16 weeks behind under McAlpine was now months and eventually years behind schedule because of that breakdown relationship between organizations. What happens next? In 1973, there's a, a fire, suspicious fire at the, the Bass Brewery in Runcorn um, where uh, a kind of a roofing, a pillared roof sets on fire and spreads very quickly uh, through the building, means the whole site being uh, undertaken major works, not opening again for a year later. 
The result of this is that the Merseyside Fire Ambulance Service undertake a review of all um, builds with a similar construction. And lo and behold, the Royal Liverpool has this um, kind of pillared roof system right at the top. And it's going to take uh, a quarter of the entire budget to replace because it's a huge fire risk. Um, bearing in mind this was identified in the early 1971 fire precautions regulations, but it wasn't acted upon because everyone's been across the, the industry to try and throw things up further and further. So what happens is that in 1974, this growing poor relations, this breakdown between the people involved turns into a complete antipathy and construction stops altogether, but it stops altogether overnight. So what happens is all the exposed concrete services, all the things that have been partially installed, they're left. What happens to those is the integrity of the concrete services deteriorates significantly. Later that comes 40 years later because the lifespan of the hospital is halved. But you've also got widespread theft from the site. I should add that large amounts of that is actually accounted for by subcontractors taking back their own materials and their own property and their own stock and items. But theft is enormous and widespread. And there's a period of time for about six or eight weeks where there's no security on the site. And anything pretty much of any value goes. Bear in mind this kind of Liverpool in the 1970s starting to draw into economic depression. In 1975, kind of, this all comes to a head and Tursons is liquidated by its own, um, its own uh, British insulated kind of cables. And there's four very large files within the Department of Health uh, records where they're trying to find some technical legal way to hold British insulated kind of cables accountable for the contract and then to honor it. But because the company that signed it was being liquidated, even though they were some subsidiary owner of it, it was all defaulted. So anything left, their payment to some contracts, their payment to creditors, their payment to everyone else, that all went completely. And so all of a sudden, because they didn't account for the high cost in the original estimate, and because the Department of Health and the Treasury were unwilling to pay reasonable costs for what was involved, the whole kind of tower of cards came crumbling down all in, in one go effectively. And so that all happens at one moment in time. 1974 and all that I put, because you know it's one of those 1066 and all that moments in NHS history, is that it's the first major national health service reorganization. Lots of people are being moved into new jobs, people are having to advertise for their own positions, it's incredibly, incredibly competitive. This on top of the prospect of hospitals that were supposed to have been closed down two years ago, unsure of where they're going to be moving into or when they're going to be moving into a new hospital. It creates enormous uh, acrimony um, within Liverpool's National Health Service. And there is a major report undertaken in 1977-1978 into industrial relations. And so the previous one was uh, the news article about that. The actual report itself likened the relationship between Liverpool um, districts or areas <coughs> which ran National Health Service in the, the city at that time and unions and its workers as a state of guerrilla warfare because the predicament was that bad. So this report goes in and says, you know, there are problems on both sides. And you have to put this in the context of Liverpool having an extremely militant uh, union leadership at the time. And historically, always had been the case, but it came very much to the fore there. But also the, the management side was in transition leading this position. So on top of this building problem, you also have a huge service change, which just creates paralysis in many respects during the 1970s. So it does have a happy ending because on the 11th of July, 1979, no uh, fewer person than Her Royal Highness, the Princess Alexandra, officially opens the new hospital. There's a very nice accompanying guide that goes with it, honouring all the people who were involved. So in 1975, the reason that there is this rapid turnaround is because following the Public Accounts Committee investigation, things start to change very quickly indeed. And the period of time that um, takes place when they finish the build and they make good a lot of their def defects is because McAlpine come back at a much greater cost than originally um, anticipated to finish the job and do it properly, which also involves undoing a lot of the previous work that had been done by Tursons in order to make it um, satisfactory uh, to open and start commissioning. So, sorry, duplicated my slide. The important lesson here is that there is a real turnaround in leadership. 1974, um, because of the NHS reorganization, a lot of people go, but because of the crisis in the, the hospital sector as well, a lot of people go. So that old guard that had dreamt about the new hospital in 1935, they all start to leave in and around 1974. 
if not slightly before, which creates this kind of huge sea change. And the people who are brought in to finish the hospital and commission it are commended by the public accounts community two years, three years later in 1978-79 by rewarding them for, for what they've done effectively to, to bring together a bad situation and finish the job. And so there was just an anecdote, which is pretty much true. Um, by one of the participants in a witness seminar, uh, it was kind of like an elite focus group that I did a few years ago when I was doing this research, where they talk about Liverpool again as being the exception that proves the rule, that the situation in Liverpool was so bad that Patrick Nairn, who's the uh, permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health, had to go back through the documents, the original planning documents for the Liverpool Hospital as a result of the request by the Public Finance Committee. And in doing so, only then did they learn that this brand new teaching hospital done by Nationalised Health Service was given approval in 1935, which shows that many of the ideas, the concepts, the original thinking, never mind the people going into doing it, are the same across the board, effectively, that trying to realise a vision in the local interest. So what am I saying? I'm going to conclude by kind of three broad take home points about comprising the present royal, but there's a, a quote that I always use in pretty much everything that I've done about this kind of local dimension. It's by Nick Timmins, who was the Financial Times uh, health correspondent back in the, the 80s and 90s, but it's very true. And he says that it's worth noting that, and rarely acknowledged uh, in public kind of debate, but the NHS isn't one organization as we kind of understand it, but it's many, and many hundreds of organizations that when you kind of count everyone together, each has its own history, culture, and local circumstances. And what I'm trying to say is that the vision behind the hospital, which opened in 1978, was pre-nationalization. That vision was nationalized as much as the health service. What am I trying to say about lessons for the current royal and its iteration? Part of the reason, so first as tragedy, second as fast, part of the real reason behind this is that the, the idea of the hospital being an international world leading um, centre, the kind of civic boosterism that goes behind it, underpins a lot of the delays. There are other hospitals in Liverpool that have been conceived of and built in between that time. Even the kind of um, kind of modern design, you know, Alder Hay, the new cancer centre that's in the centre of Liverpool, which has opened in advance of the hospital, or the one that's on the Aintree site. There are lots of new developments that are taking place, but it's because they want to celebrate it with this one building that creates all sorts of unprecedented problems. That happened in 1978, and it's happening today, the kind of faulty beams and structural design. The second bit is the, the value of internal expertise over external consultants. So United Liverpool Hospitals, the NHS body at the time, bought in architects, it bought in outside plans, it bought in management consultants for, for pioneering time in Liverpool back in the day because it didn't have the expertise. Liverpool Regional Hospital Board was also building a lot of new hospitals at this time, including entry, including out on the, the Wirral, what we call Marrow Park. Yes, they had some design problems. Yes, they had some delays. But because they had legal, architectural uh, advice on hand, they dealt with them a lot more quickly and a lot more ably. And lastly, in terms of the legacy for today, is that the debts that these hospital builds incur still take place, even if it's private finance or otherwise. Because when the hospital did open in 1978, it meant that a lot of the other hospitals that weren't planned to close had also to be closed. So within uh, five or eight years, in order to meet government imposed new budgets, Seth in general was uh, slowly closed down. Newsham, which is a separate uh, older hospital, was also closed down. They were never originally planned, but because the budget constraints imposed these changes. The same thing with the PFI now is that in 10, 15, 25 years' time, Liverpool is going to be saddled with a longer term debt than any other major acute. A hospital service provider compared to Birmingham, compared to um, Leeds, compared to Manchester. And this is going to have a huge impact on the service it's able to provide for patients, never mind the site itself. And I'll, I'll leave it there because I'm running slightly over time. Thanks.